the best response you can have to a payoff in a thriller is someone goes, oh, right, I forgot, of course, I should have thought that. On Story offers a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers, creators, and filmmakers. All of our content is recorded live at Austin Film Festival and our year-round events. To view previous episodes, visit onstory.tv. On Story is brought to you in part by the Alice Clayburgh Reynolds Foundation, a Texas family providing innovative funding since 1979. From Austin Film Festival, this is On Story, a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers, creators, and filmmakers. This week's On Story, a look behind the sci-fi hit, Snowpiercer, with co-writer Kelly Masterson. It's really about revolution. It is about um, changing your stars. If you are stuck in the tail section, you have to rise up and you have to fight back. It's an important lesson for all of us in our lives, in our personal lives. It's certainly an important lesson for us in our public life. Um, if we are stuck in a place we do not want to be, we have to change it. So that's, that's what the movie means to me. In this episode, Kelly Masterson discusses collaborating with Jun Ho Bong on his dystopian action thriller. I, I am probably the luckiest son of a in this business. Uh, Director Bong called my manager out of the blue um, one day in 2011 and said he would like to collaborate with me on his next picture. No, um, it wasn't, you know, would Kelly like to take a meeting? Would Kelly get, come in and give us his take? None of that. It's would he like to collaborate with me? I had seen Mother, um, Bong's, director Bong's um, movie that he made just prior to uh, Snowpiercer and thought it was terrific. I didn't know a lot of, uh, uh, of the rest of his work, so I watched the rest of his work. And, and if you guys haven't seen The Host or Memories of Murder or, some, or even Okja, the new one that's out, he's such a brilliant director. So yes, the answer is Yes, I totally, totally want to work with him. And that was it. That's, that's all it took. And then we were working together. So that's how it came to me. I think the reason was he had seen a movie I wrote called Before the Devil Knows You're Dead, which is not dystopian, which is not futuristic, which is not action, which is not any of the things that Snowpiercer is. So it's like, well, why me? And I never, you know, I never asked him, and I don't really know for sure, but I think it's because I write really up characters dark characters with a lot of conflict, um, passionate characters, desperate characters. And, uh, you know, what, what, do, what do characters do when they're really backed up against the wall? And that's, so those are my characters in Before the Devil Knows You're Dead, and that's what we wrote in Snowpiercer. So I think that's, uh, that's how I got that lucky. So how did Bongo, how did he find the, the script? How did that come about? He novel? found the graphic novel in a Korean comic book store and stood there and read it. Um, he didn't buy it. He stood there and read it <laughs> and said, At someday, someday I'd like to make this movie. Bong is, uh, Director Bong is fascinated with trains and said, oh, a, a movie that takes place entirely on a train. So he wanted to do that. And I think it took him a while to get to, get to it. Was funding in place? Did you have to deal with any... Any uh, interference from uh, fun, you know, money yeah. people or studio people? I'm the luckiest guy in the business, part two. <laughs> I never had to deal with any of that. I mean, I know, I know that writers oftentimes have to have that you know, foremost in their mind. Uh, you know, how, are we gonna, how the hell are we going to get this made? You know, can, I, can I have the helicopter crash? Uh, you know, it was not, a lot of times we have to worry about that kind of stuff. I, didn't ever, I never had to worry about any of it because I, I was completely um, walled off from that. The movie, the financing all came in Korea. Uh, director Bong had his, well, I, there, there were 
I found out later there were all kinds of problems, but I never dealt with them and he never shared them with me. We wrote the movie we wanted to write, he made the movie we wanted to write, and he was the one who found a way to do it. And I know that you know, oftentimes in the business that that's not how it works. Um, certainly, uh, uh, Dennis and I were talking about um, you know, making indie films and, and making movies on a budget, and oftentimes you really have to be concerned about that during the writing process. Um, and that can be inhibiting, and I was never inhibited. Uh, anything was possible. You know, we could, I, I guess in, in his mind, maybe not anything was possible because he was gonna actually have to make it. But I didn't have to worry about that. I, you know, I sat in front of my laptop and I could write whatever I wanted. And that's unusual. It was really fun to create what was on that train. Uh, a lot of it was stripping things away rather than creating new things. Although there were some new things we created too. A lot of it was getting, uh, things were going extinct. Bullets go extinct and chickens go extinct. And as things go extinct, uh, machine parts go extinct. And as they go extinct, what do you replace them with? So that was great fun to invent. I had never written action films and I didn't know how to really. Um, I don't know that I, I even do now. So I was concerned about um, writing scenes like this. I didn't really write this scene. Um, I wrote those characters though. Uh, and and I, I think it comes across sort of loud and clear. Um, Bong would give me, uh, I would write a draft, he would write a draft, I would write a draft, he would write a draft. And when I would look at his, he would have these detailed um, notes, these detailed paragraphs in the actions things that wasn't about um, necessarily about action, it was more about images. It would be, blood hits the window like rubies. I don't write action scenes that way. <laughs> um, knives fly down like fire. Things like that. So I would say, to, I remember on, on a call, I said, would you like me to, to help you with these paragraphs? And he said, no, no, not particularly. Um, because the way I would write action scenes would be, Curtis punches the guy. Curtis gets hit with an ax, you know, that, that sort of thing. And in fact, that is a lot of what's going on. But what I really love about this scene is, it's really ballet to me. What Bong does with this is, um, it's art, the music is, uh, is very elemental and it's more emotional. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of action movies where it's really about the action, but you can really tell this is about the character, or at least I, that's what I feel. You know, I feel what Curtis is feeling. And Bong is so brilliant at giving us Curtis's face and then taking it away. And then when Curtis comes back into the scene, he's moving forward with that determination. And then Curtis has blood on his face. And then his number two, Edgar, looks at him with such adoration and such fear. Those are the things that, that are brilliant. Uh, about what director Bong does. So if I've learned anything from working with him, it's to try to make sure that you're giving your director um, as much character as you can and what the emotional stakes are in an action scene. Because frankly, he's not really gonna pay much attention to Curtis punches a guy. He's not really gonna pay attention to that. When he gets there on the day, he's gonna be shooting the scene the way he sees it in his head. And hopefully you'll be working with a director as brilliant as him who can, you know, can create a scene like that. Or another scene I love is when they're in the classroom and our guys come in there and they're standing and they're in the center and they're just that, they're, what was that about? How did that scene come about? I mean, I find that to be, it's so out of character to the train. So what did the prophetic Mr. Wilford invent to protect the chosen from that calamity? Yes, yes. Rumble, rumble, rattle, rattle, it will never die! <laughs> what happens if the engine stops? We, we all freeze and die. But will it stop or will it stop? No, no! Can you tell us why? The, the engine, engine is eternal, yes! The engine is forever, yes! Rumble, rumble, rattle, rattle, who is the reason why? Wilford Young! Wilford Young! Hooray! Oh, I love that one. So Teutonic. Director Bong says, oh, let's, let's write something funny here. <laughs> and so I, uh, I, I, I was the one that came, you know, he was the one who came up with the idea that they should sing. And I was the one who got to write the lyrics for it. The lyrics are the stupidest 
lyrics in any movie ever. But I am a lyricist now. I'm a, a lyricist who actually got a, a, a song done in a movie. Uh, so that was a great fun to write. It was really fun working with director Bong and to work with a Korean director. Uh, all of my work, really, is usually about a specific tone. You know, you, you, you kind of know what story you're telling and you tell it in a certain way. That's the way we American filmmakers kind of do it. That's not the way the Koreans do it. They do it in all these different tones and all these different palettes that he uses. So, I mean, for that scene to be in a movie where we had the ballet and where we have these dark scenes uh, is really remarkable uh, and, and an awful lot of fun. So writing it, uh, it, it was an adventure. Uh, we began, I don't know if this was me or if this was the two of us, but it, it was, I, each um, car of the train felt like a, a one-act play to me. It had to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And it should each, of course, reflect the major theme, but it should each give a different color to it, was the way we thought of it. I know f that uh, when director Bong worked with the, uh, the designers, he, he worked on that and making sure that each, uh, train car had a different feel and a different look to it, and oftentimes a different color palette to it. Um, you know, we start in very dark, very grays and blacks and charcoals and work our way through a color palette, uh, which, is, uh, which is terrific fun if, if you're a writer that you get the opportunity to write a scene like that you know, in a movie you know, where you're also going to kill everyone. It's fun. All right, we're here, tail section. Quarantine section, prison section. Gate, gate, gate. Four seconds when all three gates are open at once. We have four seconds to go through three gates and bust Nam out. And then Nam um, gets us the rest of the way. Our fate depends on this man. We come from very different cultures and very different worlds, and of course we're different people, so we have different ideas about what's important. Uh, and so in, in this scene, this sort of sets up the theme of revolution, and it sets up the journey that Curtis is going to take, and there's his mentor. Well, you know, Director Bong and I had a very different idea about Curtis. We had a very different idea about Gilliam, the part played by here uh, by John Hurt, when we first started. My mind was, this is um, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. I wanted the older, uh, more peaceful, let's, you know, let's take a measured approach to our situation versus the radical, let's kick some ass, let's get to the front of the train and kill that. And that was what I suggested. And it's, well, I started writing. That's what I started writing. And Bong didn't, didn't really, wasn't really interested in that at all. I think part of that was a cultural thing. Um, and the other thing was he had something else in mind for Gilliam, that Gilliam was complicit. So he wasn't uh, the Martin Luther King kind of a character. So that was the sort of give and take that you, you have when you're working with a collaborator, but also the give and take that you have when you're working with a director and the give and take you have when you're working across the globe, because I would Skype with director Bong. He was in Seoul, Korea. I was in New Jersey. And every Monday morning, 7 o'clock my time, 7 p.m. his time, 7 a.m. my time, we would talk about these things. In the film, you, there's so many relationships. And uh, Curtis has relationships you know, with Wilford and Gilliam and Naum and Edgar, et cetera, et cetera. And there are different relationships, which is the way life is. I mean, how does a writer go about doing that. Yeah, isn't this what we love to do, though? I mean, we, this is what we writers love to do, is, is create characters and, and relationships. It's, uh, I think, coming from the theater, uh, it, it was, it was, it's always been a strength of mine. And I think, again, this is maybe something that director Bong saw in me that he knew uh, would help strengthen the film. Uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of fathers and sons, big, big theme in my work. Uh, and, and, and that's what we have in, in this film. Uh, primarily, there's, there's three, four important relationships. Uh, and Curtis is the center of everything. Curtis is always the center of everything. Um, he has a father figure, that mentor who, who taught him, saved him in order to fulfill his purpose. That's the John Hurt. Um, oh, John Hurt was such a wonderful, wonderful man. Uh, uh, so there's that character. Uh, who who sets him on his journey, but keeps the secret of the of the world. You know, the world is an unfair place, and keeps that secret from him because he doesn't want to disillusion Curtis. Uh, sets him on his journey. Doesn't ever believe that Curtis is going to do what Curtis does. 
Then there is Edgar and Curtis. So Edgar is the, the younger brother, uh, kind of a character, terrific to write brothers. I love writing brother characters. Have two of my own. Uh, never draw on those relationships uh, <laughs> in my work. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm moved by the scene when Curtis sacrifices his younger brother. He has an opportunity to save his brother, Edgar, or, or he can go forward with his mission. And he, it's an impossible choice, and he, he chooses to go forward with his mission. It's interesting that you learn much later in the film that there was a point when uh, Curtis was going to kill baby Edgar and, and didn't. He was, he was stopped from killing baby Edgar by, by Gilliam. So it's a complex relationship. And then there's the relationship that uh, you see with uh, his, count, his, his partner in Revolution, Nam. They don't understand each other, but they need each other and they use each other. Um, it, they, they sort of eventually form the sort of brother kind of relationship uh, where they have a lot to teach one another. Uh, and then finally, and we'll get to that one maybe a little bit later, um, is the, the one with the guy who's running everything, Wilford. And that is another father-son relationship. Um, and it's a real, it was so much fun to write. And again, an opportunity where Bong gave me an awful lot of rope uh, to, uh, to, uh, to really explore that. Open the gate. Director Bong really let me sort of voice uh, Curtis and, and Gilliam, the, the mentor. But he really, the director Bong's voice is really what you're hearing uh, through, through Nam. And this is, I think this shows like the perfect collaboration of you know, the two worlds. Uh, and the, the, the different ways that these two characters think. Curtis has been single-minded for 18 years. It's, it's linear, it's get to the front of the train, and it's always pushing that way. That's where freedom is. We had written a line uh, where Nam says, well, it doesn't matter if the train is going that way or if the train is going this way, you're still stuck inside the train. What we have to do is get out of the train. So again, it kind of goes back to theme. How do you, uh, what does revolution mean? Is, it, do you just replace the, the guy who's up in front? Is that what revolution is? And then you become him? Um, or is it you know, to, to remake it, rethink it, think outside the box? And that's what Nam is doing. So when, the, when we get to this point in the movie, um, the two partners in revolution each have a very different idea about what revolution means. Um, one is kill the leader, the other is blow the whole thing up. And eventually, this, the, in this story, I don't know that we should do this in the United States, <laughs> But in this story, the answer is blow the whole thing up and start over. And that's eventually you know, what we do. In this locomotive we call home, there is one thing that between our warm hearts and the bitter cold. Clothing? Shields? No. Order. Order is the barrier that holds back the frozen death. We must, all of us, on this train of life, remain in our allotted station. We must, each of us, occupy our preordained particular position. Would you wear a shoe on your head? Of course you wouldn't wear a shoe on your head. A shoe doesn't belong on your head. A shoe belongs on your foot. A hat belongs on your head. I am a hat. You are a shoe. I belong on the head. You belong on the foot. Yes, so it is. I wrote the, the part of Minister Mason for a man, and in fact, uh, we, we dreamed and hoped we'd get Paul Giamatti for it, who would have been terrific. Uh, but Tilda met with director Bong, and was a fan, and said, I'd love to do anything you're doing. And he says, well, I don't really have anything in this next picture. And she read the script and said, can I do Minister Mason? And he obviously allowed her to. And, and so what you get is this terrific 
really off-the-wall portrayal of Minister Mason by Tilda Swinton, who based it on her nanny uh, when she was a child. <laughs> if you can imagine that nanny. Um, if, if you listen closely, there's times in the film where they call direct, uh, Minister Mason uh, him, because they didn't even change the, the pronouns. Uh, they just, you know, she, she played it as, as the, way, the way it was written. So, uh, so that was terrific. The way this scene came about was, Director Bong will oftentimes um, uh, say to me, uh, let's do something funny here. Let's, let, it, this should be funny. And I won't have a clue you know, what that's supposed to be. So he had sent back a draft of this scene where, uh, so just to set it up, I, it isn't set up real well. Um, the, the character that Ewan Bremer plays is Andrew. He has thrown that shoe and hit um, a, a, a front section person in the head with it. So Minister Mason comes to punish him. His arm is stuck out the window and it's frozen. So that's what's happening during the scene. And she puts that shoe on his head. So the, the, a draft of this came back from director Bong in which uh, she, he has the shoe on a platter. It's brought to, to Minister Mason on a platter. Here's the, the offensive thing, she holds it up. And uh, he said, let's do something funny here. So eventually I wrote um, maybe a two-page monologue. You don't get to write two-page monologues in, in film very often. I, I was lucky, I actually got to write you know, several soliloquies in this, uh, uh, in this particular film. I, I, I came from the stage, so I love to write dialogue, and I always write way too much of it, and then I have to edit it back. This was a, a scene where you know, Director Bong really gave me a lot of rope and let me just write this scene. It's my, it, it is my favorite scene in the movie. It, also, it, it sets up perfectly what, you know, what the themes are, but it does it in a, in a way that's, that's I think is, is great fun. Put that uh, in, uh, in Tilda Swinton's mouth, and I think it's a terrific scene. Section after section, precisely where they've always been and where they'll always be, all adding up to what? The train. And now the perfectly correct number of human beings, all in their proper places, all adding up to what? Humanity. The train is the world, we the humanity. And now you have this sacred responsibility to lead all of humanity. Without you, Curtis, humanity will cease to exist. Usually when you get to the end of a movie, you're, you're supposed to like, especially if it's a train movie, you're supposed to like put it into high gear and let's just race through to the end. Uh, and, you know, Director Bong gave me the opportunity, gave us the opportunity to really slow it down and to get into Curtis's head because this is the penultimate moment in Curtis's journey. He has made it there. What does he want? What the f*** does he want at the end of the day? Does he want to kill Wilford? And if he does, what's that going to mean? Or does he want to take over? He's never thought of that. So this is the seduction. This is what am I going to do now that I got what I want? You know, now that I caught and I'm the dog that caught the car, what do I do? And so that's what this scene is about. And, uh, and we had the luxury thing, and we didn't listen to Harvey, to, you know, to keep this scene in where that's the ultimate thing is what do you do? You know, it's, it's, yes, you have to get out of your box, but what do you do when you get out of your box? And he's so tempted to take Wilford's place. And it is tempting because humanity is and what if I can make a difference? What if I can be the savior? You know, that's the greatest seduction. And of course, a moment later, he realizes that the kids are being used as machine parts, and this is up, and it's, it's got to end. And I have, I've been saved not for, to run the train. I've been saved to save the kids. I've been saved to create a new world. So that's what that final scene is. So in is. the end, do you think he got what he wanted or yes. what he needed? Yes, he didn't. But you know, it's what, you asked this question earlier of me today, and it's such a good question. I'd never really thought of it that way. He doesn't really get what he wants. He gets what he needs. And when he, when he finally gets there, it is ultimately what, what, he, what he wants, what, what's, what it is. It's really about revolution. It is about um, changing your stars. If you are stuck in the tail section, you have to rise up and you have to fight back. It's an important lesson for, for all of us in our lives, in our personal lives. It's certainly an important lesson for us in our public life. Um, if we are stuck in a place we do not want to be, we have to change it. So that's, that's what the movie means to me. Um, uh, at the same time, you know, it's, it's very important to me, you know, that we think about issues like global warming and where we're heading. Uh, you know, are, are, we, uh, are, are we getting on a, a, a train that's going to take us to nowhere? Ultimately, at the end, and I've had people tell me it's a depressing movie, and I've never thought so. Ultimately, at the end, um, we're freed from that box. 
Uh, a lot of people have to die, <laughs> but we're freed from that box. And when we are freed from that box, the whole world opens up and we get to start again. So I've always th seen it as a very hopeful picture. You've been watching a conversation with Kelly Masterson on On Story. On Story is part of a growing number of programs in Austin Film Festival's On Story project, including the On Story PBS series, now streaming online, the On Story radio program and podcast in collaboration with Public Radio International, and the On Story book series available on Amazon. To find out more about On Story and Austin Film Festival, visit onstory.tv or austinfilmfestival.com. response you can have to a payoff in a thriller is someone goes, oh, right, I forgot, of course, I should have thought. Yeah. On Story offers a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers, creators, and filmmakers. All of our content is recorded live at Austin Film Festival and our year-round events. To view previous episodes, visit onstory.tv.